Today we've got a big in-depth cooking, seasoning, and review feature on this guy. This is a made-in, 10 and a quarter inch, blue carbon steel frying pan. Does it cook delicious food? Is it a good pan for your money? I don't know. Let's find out. Made in sells direct to consumers. You won't find one of these at your local store. I have no relationship with the company and bought this pan with my own money. It is not a free pan provided for any kind of marketing purposes. The pan weighs in at a skosh over three pounds and is two millimeters thick, which puts it at the lighter, thinner end of the carbon steel spectrum. It's 10 and a quarter inches wide from rim to rim and has a little over seven inches diameter of cooking surface area. The handle is attached with three rivets. They say it's strong enough to handle 2,000 pounds of pressure. Now, unless my wife tries to make one of her omelets, I think we're good here. Now, it's blue carbon steel, which is essentially regular carbon steel with a heat treatment applied, which helps protect it from oxidation early on. It still needs an initial cleaning and seasoning, so I'm washing it here with dish soap and hot water, and then, following the instructions, I'm heating it on the stovetop, wiping it really well with oil, wiping it until it looks dry, and baking it in a 450 degree oven for an hour, letting it cool, and now we're ready to do some cooking. I'm going to start out with some fried okra. I'm going to cook this on my electric stovetop in my basement. And as I always say, raw okra is kind of like a Washington politician, naturally slimy. You don't really need to add anything to get the breading to stick to the okra. All you do is spread it out on a tray, drop in pieces of your fresh okra, roll those around, shake off the excess and you end up with nice breaded okra without having to use an egg or any kind of milk or buttermilk to get the batter to stick. Now I've got the pan heating on my electric flat top. Now this is the very first time I've used this pan. I don't know how it heats. I don't know how that two millimeter thick metal is going to react. So I'm taking a little bit of extra precaution to heat it slowly. I don't want to run into any warping issues right off the bat. So I'm heating it on medium low for two minutes. And then I'm cranking it up to medium for another couple of minutes. Then in goes my okra. And it's actually sliding around. No sticking whatsoever. That's very nice. And absolutely delicious. We chowed it down and we're off and cooking. Next up are some fried zucchini and some fried squash. Now these squash are a little bit ratty looking. But it's early in the season. And although I prefer to eat local stuff. Right now that would be snow and pine cones. Slice these a quarter inch or so thick. Now, unlike the slimy okra, you do have to take a few steps to get breading to stick to the zucchini and squash. Dip the pieces into milk, then dip them into the breading. Let those rest for a minute. Then I dip them into milk, then roll them into breadcrumbs. And I do that until I have a nice tray of breaded zucchini and squash. Back to the electric stove, and here we go. What I like about cooking these is A, they're delicious, but B, I can kind of spread them evenly around the pan and I can tell if the pan has any serious heating issues, any hot spots in one area versus another based on how they brown. Now a couple of important notes here on how this pan cooks. I'm noticing that I'm getting pretty good frying edge to edge and that is because on this stovetop I have a burner element that really lines up well with the size of this pan. Remember that for later when we get to the induction. And here I started to notice a few red flags when it comes to the thickness of this made-in pan. Now this is a thinner pan as we've noted and many people will say that a thinner pan is more responsive to changes in heat than a thicker pan would be. Another way to look at that is if you're not careful you can quickly overshoot on the heat and scorch your food. Some of these early batches I've been cooking on power level 5 just by increasing that power level one notch from five to six, this batch of zucchini almost burnt in just a little over a minute, yet the interior is nowhere near done correctly. So I find that a thicker carbon steel skillet has a little bit more forgiveness, if you will, a little bit bigger sweet spot, a little bit bigger safer cooking zone. Next I want to crank the heat up just a little bit and brown some ground beef for weeknight sloppy joes. Now I'm a big chicken here, and I've got the sloppy joe sauce in a different pan because it has some tomato in there and I don't want anything acidic in the carbon steel because it might pull the seasoning off. So I get my beef broken up, get the heat cranked up. Everything is going really well, no sticking. You can see the beef is sliding around. Then after a couple minutes, all of a sudden everything just fused to the bottom of the pan. 
I mean, it really stuck, much more so than I was expecting. I always expect a few sticky bits when I brown beef, but nothing like this. Now, I got all the beef cooked and got it over, transferred over to the Sloppy Joe's. But this stuff stuck on the bottom. I figured I would deglaze that. I had a little bit of chicken stock here. Poured that in and deglazed it. And surprisingly here, that took off all of my seasoning down to the bare metal. I was not expecting that. The chicken stock is not acidic, but somehow it took off all the seasoning down to the bare metal. Now the Sloppy Joes were fine. It's tough to make a bad Sloppy Joe, but the pan here needs some maintenance. So what I did here was do another maintenance seasoning in the oven. Okay, now with the freshly seasoned pan moving up to my gas stovetop, I thought I'd try one of nature's most perfect foods, breakfast sausage. And here I also ran into a little trouble. Now part of this might be my fault. When I was little and we cook a pan of sausage, there would be a pan of sausage grease left over. They're not putting near as much fat into sausage these days. So I probably should have added just a little bit of oil to the pan. I didn't. I put the sausage in the pan, brought it up to heat, hoping some fat would render out. And these things just stuck. Now, sometimes when you get that Maillard reaction, meat will stick just a little bit in the pan and then release. These things never released. It was also a little bit difficult to maneuver a spatula in a pan of this size. But those sausages are really, really stuck on there. So this is not non-stick. This is stick, but with a homemade buttermilk biscuit, still pretty darn tasty anyway. So after the beef and the sausage sticking problems, what might get us back on track? How about a pan of bacon? I get my bacon laid out in the pan, then put it on a burner. And as the burner brings the pan up to temperature, that bacon will render out a little bit of fat and then it won't stick. Now, unlike the sausage, thank goodness bacon is still full of fat. So it didn't stick, it browned up nicely, and I think the made-in pan did a nice job cooking this bacon. Now let's try some cooking on the induction. Now, how do you like your burger? If you answered both rare and well done in the same patty, you're gonna love this. Now, how in the world does this happen? Let's take a step back and boil some water to illustrate what is going on. We've shown in the past that carbon steel and induction burners tend to not play well together. Several factors contribute to this. On the induction side, even though burners appear to be large and the right size for a pan, oftentimes the heating coil underneath is much smaller than the diameter of the burner appears. Also, inductions have thermostats that tend to kick on and off, blasting heat, then stopping, over and over, which can contribute to warping. To mitigate warping, manufacturers sometimes put an upward bow in the bottom of carbon steel pans, which you can see in this made in. But that bow means that even though the pan doesn't wobble and appears to sit flat, it really isn't making full contact with the burner surface underneath. And we know that induction heats only where there is direct contact with a pan. Add to that the fact that carbon steel is light years away from copper in terms of heat conductivity. And you get this, a heat donut. You can really see it when boiling water. The pan isn't touching in the middle, so no heat transfer there. The coil isn't as big as the burner looks, so no heat transfers out by the edge. And the carbon steel metal itself doesn't conduct heat efficiently. So you just get a heat donut. Now, if you let it keep going long enough, the middle of that donut will eventually fill in, but it never does go to the edges. Using my temperature gun, I was getting temp differentials of almost 200 degrees between the donut and just an inch or so away on the cooking surface, not even up the sides of the pan. And it turns out my burger was straddling the donut. Now, if this were chicken instead of beef, temping one end of a chicken breast and thinking it's done, but having the other end undercooked could lead to some real problems. And this happens with other carbon steels as well. I'm not assigning blame here. I'm just noting that carbon steel and induction often don't play well together. Next up, impossible burgers. Oh Lord. You know, I was just looking at the package here and it talks about saving the planet. And you know, that reminds me, I didn't check outside after cooking those hamburgers. Excuse me for a second. Oh. Quick, make an impossible burger. Use plenty of oil, Ingo the Impossibles. They are sizzling, but stuck like bleep on a sheet. Not getting any nonstick properties here. 
Now, preposterously exaggerated planetary claims aside, after chiseling these things out, my wife actually said they tasted good. Now, I still prefer beef, but for a veggie burger, I thought these were okay. And if nothing else, at least they didn't produce the burning plastic smell that we seem to get when we cook Beyond Meat. And let's just do a quick planet check here. Thank goodness. Now back to the pan. I've been getting a mixed bag when it comes to sticking. I did three additional stovetop seasonings, so I think the cooking surface is in pretty good shape here. These home fries, they're not sticking, and I can adjust the heat once they're in and cooking. But with these chicken nuggies for my son, and for me actually, the pan temp was off to the races, and not only did the nuggets stick at first, they quickly got overdone on the outside, yet undercooked in the middle in about one minute. To me, this seems to be related to the pan thickness issue, so let's drill down on that a bit. Here you can see the made-in pan next to a baking steel 10 and a quarter inch carbon steel skillet, which also has a strip stainless steel handle. Very similar pan and the one I consider to be the made-in's most direct competition. The difference here is that the made-in is two millimeters thick and the baking steel three millimeters. If one millimeter of metal sounds like no big deal, another way to look at it is there is a 50% difference. To illustrate, let's bring some oil up to smoking in both pans. I'm using the same burner for both pans, leaving it at the same temperature, not adjusting it during the test. Same amount of oil wiped around each pan, and don't worry, I'll wipe this out when it begins to smoke so that it doesn't get gunky. On go the pans. The made end starts to smoke after a minute and 40 seconds. The baking steel smokes at 2 minutes and 20 seconds. That 40 seconds is a 40% difference in coming up to screaming high seasoning temperatures. I find that bringing the pans up to normal cooking temperatures, especially for things like eggs, the thinner pan is much harder to micromanage. We always say to add eggs when the butter stops bubbling and crackling. But on the flat tops with the thinner pan, is this butter ready or did it stop bubbling and crackling simply because the thermostat kicked off? It's hard to tell. On the gas, if I heat the pan on a higher flame, I could get butter browning quickly out near the edges, but not hot enough in the middle. Finagling with it and cooking lots of eggs, I found that scrambled eggs actually turned out okay, pretty nice. For fried eggs, I finally got them to slide with more heat and more butter. But even though they moved, they weren't really the way I want to eat them. It was very difficult to get good fried eggs with this pan. And I think it is all related to trying to manage heat in a thinner pan. For me, a thicker pan is just easier to cook in and I get better food results more easily, especially with more delicate and precise foods like fried eggs. So if we can't be precise, let's switch gears and do a little blunt force cooking and sear a big juicy steak. Carbon steel really shines when it comes to high heat searing. No need to worry about temperature control here, just crank it up to high. I bring the pan up to heat, water drops roll around like little ball bearings. I salted and peppered the steak, in goes a little oil, it smokes, in goes the steak. Oh yeah. Two minutes on the first side, give it a flip, no sticking, nice Maillard reaction, and that's a good looking crust and sear, I have to say. Sear the second side, then in goes a meat thermometer and now into the oven to finish cooking. This is where that stainless steel handle is really nice to have because it is oven safe. We like to bring our steaks up to 128 degrees internally, then let them rest and they come on up to about 134 or so and then they are done the way we like them. Everyone has his or her own preference. The pan goes nicely from stovetop to oven and back. And while the handle remained cool throughout all the stovetop cooking tests, here, coming out of the oven, it's screaming hot. But with the steak, I think the made-in did a fantastic job. Value. I paid $69 for this pan. That's getting fairly pricey. At that price, there is some stiff competition. As of press time, for $69, you can get two Matfer pans. You can also get a Debouillet Mineral B for about $15 less. And that baking steel pan we showed, you can get that for $79. Now all have their nuances, but these competing pans are all thicker and the baking steel in particular is three millimeters thick and I think definitely worth that $10 price bump. So like a nice piece of fish at the deli counter, let's wrap it up. This made in 10 and a quarter inch blue carbon steel skillet, how did it do? Well, with about a third of the things I cooked, it did a fantastic job. 
With the other two thirds, well, had some problems there, didn't we? I showed those in the video. Now all these foods I've cooked in today's video, I have also cooked in other reviews for other pans. The other pans I've cooked this stuff in, they were thicker, they were heavier. And I just find that a thicker, heavier pan kind of smooths out some of the peaks and valleys. In pan temperature, it gives you a bigger sweet spot, a bigger time zone in which to produce good food. Now the build quality is fine, the handle's fine, the look and feel is fine, but when it comes down to it, I just think it's too thin. It was too difficult for me to get the pan heated correctly and to maintain that temperature. And add to that that this pan has a fairly premium price, but didn't really produce premium results. The negatives unfortunately outweigh the positives here. And I have to give this made-in 10 and a quarter inch blue carbon steel frying pan a slight thumbs down. Now, if you've enjoyed this video, want to see others like it, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn your notifications on. Just because you're subscribed doesn't mean YouTube will actually show you the videos I produce. You leave your questions, comments, and feedback below. Check out the shopping links. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen. <music>